the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading uh, for today uh, was probably familiar uh, to all of us. Uh, the story of Cain and Abel, and, and uh, Cain going and murdering uh, his son. But as familiar as uh, this reading generally is uh, to, to most people, I find that there's one thing uh, in that text uh, that uh, people are really not really familiar with and they don't think of too often. And it may play a significant role in, in that text. And that point that they don't understand is, is you, know, you know, how long did Cain hate his brother? As long as he was able. <laughs> That's my one joke I know, and it's just <laughs> that I can tell. So anyway, uh, the point of this, <laughs> there's no point to the joke, um, but uh, the point of uh, the reading for today really does tie in with the gospel and uh, the theme of the entire day, and that is the very last part of the last verse from that reading. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. In spite of what Cain had done, and even in spite of uh, what, uh, the way he tried to back out of his responsibility, my, my brother's keeper, you know, uh, there's uh, nothing there. And so that, he was a pretty miserable person actually for what he tried to get out of. Yet, God put that mark on Cain to protect him. It was a mark of God's grace and favor, even to the sinner Cain. I want to focus on the gospel reading for today and kind of walk through that, uh, that gospel and, and make, make some points that are, that are there. Um, first verse, verse 9, it's, it's verse 9 of the text. Uh, and this is what Luke tells us that Jesus also, this is Luke speaking or writing. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So what's happening here is Luke is kind of giving a heads up uh, to what this is, uh, this parable is all about. Of course, Luke had heard it before, he's recording it, uh, and he's saying this is what, uh, what is Jesus is going to be talking about here. Uh, those who uh, trusted in themselves for their righteousness and treated others with contempt. Then the next verse, verse 10, this is where Jesus begins speaking. It's a parable now. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. They went up to the temple to pray, and the tradition was back then is that uh, during the morning and evening sacrifices is when people gathered uh, in the temple to pray. Uh, and it was permitted then. And the, the morning sacrifice was around 9 o'clock in the morning, the afternoon uh, around three o'clock. And so uh, that's when this, the setting of this parable is taking place. And apparently too, the way Jesus tells it, it seems that both the Pharisee and the tax collector were there at the, at the same time. Whether it was morning or afternoon, uh, we don't know. And so there are these two protagonists uh, in the gospel or in the parable that Jesus tells. Uh, one, a Pharisee, and again, you may remember that uh, the Pharisees were the, the super pious laymen. Uh, they were the ones who made every effort to uh, keep all of the Sabbath laws, all of the traditional laws uh, that, uh, that the Jews had. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, things was is that, uh, among the Pharisees anyway, uh, they had this belief that if two successive Sabbaths could be kept perfectly, then the Messiah would come. Uh, where they got that, I don't know. But that's kind of the, uh, the idea that they had, the tradition that they had. And so that's why they were uh, so um, adamant in keeping for themselves and trying to get other people as well, uh, other Jews, to keep the Sabbath perfectly uh, so that the Messiah would come. So we have the Pharisee there, and then, of course, the tax collector. And tax collectors were despised by, by all the Jews. Uh, because tax collectors, they were, they were Jews, um, but they basically worked for the Roman Empire, collecting taxes. 
um, and the way they, they, the tax collectors, made their living is that if the uh, uh, Roman government said, okay, uh, this certain individual owes $100 in taxes, uh, then the tax collector would say, would charge him, you know, 120 or 150 or whatever he could get away with. And so he'd gather that and the excess over the 100 that was demanded from the Roman government, he would keep for himself. Uh, so actually, uh, then, he was kind of cheating his, his own fellow Jews, and that's why tax collectors were, were so despised. So those are the two who, uh, whom Jesus puts together in this, uh, in this parable that he tells today. And Jesus goes on. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. So Jesus says, and again, remember this is a parable, something, a story that Jesus is making up, uh, but he tries to give a mental uh, uh, image of what was going on there in this parable. And says the Pharisee was standing by himself. And I think the kind of idea there is he wanted the hearers uh, to sort of picture what was going on and that the Pharisee was maybe like center stage, okay, uh, there. And I don't, we don't know how many people gathered for prayers at those uh, those two hours of the day but anyway probably a group of people there but he wants Jesus in the parable wants us to focus first of all on this Pharisee and so standing there by himself probably you know center stage you know so that so that everyone everyone could see him and it says and he prayed thus and again remember this is a parable so Jesus trying to give a, a, a physical an image in the mind in the mind's eye and so probably uh, he was having the Pharisee to pray aloud and again that was that was rather common I mean the, the, the Jews even when they get got together for prayers like that uh, they would be together and they'd be saying their own individual prayers but saying them aloud you know, not necessarily you know at the top of their lungs probably but they, they spoke their prayers aloud but again it seems to me that the the mental image that Jesus was trying to give us in this parable or at least give to those people back then and to us is that there he was center stage and probably speaking louder than everyone else okay because the focus was on this on this Pharisee and he prayed thus God I thank you that I am not like other men and then he lists a couple the ways he views other men extortioners unjust adulterers and the other man is probably his fellow Jews because again not all Jews were as pious in their practice as the Pharisees were you know and many of them probably weren't even uh, pious at all uh, maybe they just you know forgot the r rules and regulations that they were supposed to follow so anyway, so I, first of all the Pharisees I'm glad I'm not like these other men these other Jews who are uh, who don't care about the Sabbath they don't care about uh, keeping the uh, the laws that you have given us uh, very specific I I'm glad I'm not like them and then I sort of picture Jesus you know in this parable trying to get, uh, have people to see that uh, maybe this Pharisee I'm glad I'm not like other men and then he sort of starts scanning the crowd there however many uh, many were there and he says or even like this tax collector and so maybe as a well-known tax collector huh? I, can, I can see uh, the Pharisee kind of looking over the crowd this tax collector points him out even so that everybody's attention is directed to to that man and then uh, in verse 12 the uh, in the parable the Pharisee continues I fast twice a week I give tithes that all that I get he fasts twice a week and that was sort of again common for uh, for all good Jews and certainly for, for the Pharisees that they would fast twice a week uh, the tradition back then was for them to fast on Mondays and Thursdays you know I'm not, I'm not sure why those particular days but later on uh, the Christians you know, they adopted as their practice uh, and again early Christians were Jewish uh, and so they had this Jewish background of, of, of fasting and so the early Christians fasted they fasted on on Wednesdays and Fridays because Wednesday was the day during Holy Week when the plot against Jesus was hatched and then on Friday, of course, that's when he was crucified. So that's when the Christians uh, fasted, the later Christians. But uh, these Jews and this Pharisee uh, in the parable says, I, I observe the rule and regulation. I observe the, uh, the tradition. Uh, I fast.
twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. And again, this Pharisee may have had uh, more than one source of income. Uh, maybe he was making interest on some of the money that he had and even fasted on the money that he got back uh, from his investments. He fasts, he tithes everything that he gets. And so in all of this, what the Pharisee is praying there is that he's letting God know that he, the Pharisee, you know, considers himself the best of the best, okay, in Jewish ob observances. The Pharisees were the best, and he's trying to point out that I'm the best of the best. I do it all, maybe even over and above what others do. I tithe all that I get. And you can't miss it. But what this Pharisee is doing in this parable, uh, what he's doing is uh, thanking God. That's how he begins, right? Okay? Uh, starts his prayer out. God, I thank you. And what does he thank God for? Himself. He says, Every, this is what I do. I thank God. You know, this is the way I am. I, I'm thanking you, God, because I'm such a good person. I keep all the rules and regulations and all the traditions. I do it all. I thank you, God, you know, that I'm not like anybody else. I'm the best of the best. So Luke was right on, spot on, when he introduced this parable in, the, in verse 9. He, he tells it, Jesus told, us this, uh, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, which is certainly what this Pharisee was doing, and that they were righteous, and treated others with contempt. Glad I'm not like other men, glad I'm especially not like this Pharisee. He can treat it, treated everyone with contempt. Then Jesus continues, verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says the tax collector was standing far off, probably behind the rest of the crowd that gathered way in the back. And this a tax collector was nowhere near center stage like the Pharisee was. He was probably back in the wings somewhere, a place where he wouldn't be noticed at all. Wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, which was kind of a posture of praying you know, amongst the Jews and even among some Christians today. You know, Wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven because he felt shame and he was humble, wouldn't even raise his eyes to God. And Jesus says he beat his breast. That was a sort of a physical express, expression of guilt. This tax collector was a man apparently much like, at least in spirit, much like David when he wrote Psalm 51 and said of himself that he was a man with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That was David. That was certainly the attitude that Jesus is portraying for this tax collector, a man of a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And he prays very briefly, God, be merciful to me. The Greek word there that's translated to be merciful um, is, uh, carries the, also the, the, the connotation of, of a desire for, for atonement, for, for reconciliation, being made one again with, uh, with God. And as I considered that word, what that kind of means is that he desired, as, as Jesus tells the parable, that he's trying to lift up this tax collector as the example, is that this tax collector desired, I'm not sure what to call it, the, the, the completion of God's forgiveness. You know, again, I, I think uh, we are called, you know, to forgive as well. And I think we can, we can forgive people. And if someone's done something against us, we can forgive them. And I think basically the understanding of forgiveness is, you know, not wish evil upon or nothing against, okay, 
you, you don't want anything bad to happen to them. You don't want any retribution. You forgive the person. But I think it's possible also for us, this is another one for me, uh, to forgive that way and not wish evil or bad or anything on the person who sinned against me. But even after I've forgiven that person for whatever it was, the relationship still just isn't quite what it used to be, you know? Uh, it's, there's maybe some distance now that wasn't there before. This person sinned against me. I forgave him. Do not anything evil to happen? But it's just not the same anymore. You know, I'm not really reconciled to that person. It's not the way it used to be. The word here that Jesus uses is that this tax collector also desired reconciliation, not just forgiveness, if that's okay to say that, I guess, but also the completion of that forgiveness of God, for God also reconciles through his forgiveness. And that's what this tax collector desired. That's what he wanted. To be right, he wanted to be the way it was before, the way it's supposed to be between God and one of his people. God, be merciful to me. Reconcile me to yourself as well as forgive me. God, be merciful to me. And then the translation goes on and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But it's interesting to note that in the Greek text, <laughs> what the word is, the sinner. It's not a sinner, but there's the word in there, the sinner. The tax collector is saying to God, God, I am not just a sinner, not just one amongst many. I am the sinner. It sounds to me like what, what uh, Jesus is portraying in the, in the lips of uh, this tax collector is that he sees himself as the embodiment of sin, maybe, huh? Maybe to use Paul's phrase, chief of sinners, I am the sinner, not just one of among many. And so the tax collector, though while the Pharisee was telling God that he was the best of the best, the tax collector seems to be saying that he recognizes that he is the worst of the worst, chief of sinners, to borrow a phrase that Paul would later write about. And, and so speaking of Paul, uh, you know, he, he wrote his letters uh, before the Gospels were written. Now, the events of the Gospel took place first, and then, you know, and then, and then later on, Paul was sort of a cont contemporary of Jesus, maybe a little later, later contemporary, but then he wrote his epistles. And then years later, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at different times, then they wrote what happened in the life of Jesus and his teaching and his ministry. And so I'm wondering, uh, at, at Paul's time, uh, the, the New Testament wasn't written yet. The Gospels weren't written. But I wonder if Paul was familiar with this parable that we have in our text today, the one that Jesus told. I don't know. Uh, he, I guess he could have been, but, but maybe not. Maybe Paul uh, didn't have everything that Jesus ever said and did. It wasn't written down yet. You know, uh, maybe the stuff was revealed to him. We just, we just don't know what that's like. But whether or not Paul uh, was aware of this parable, uh, the Holy Spirit nevertheless inspired him to write what Jesus had taught in this parable. And Paul wrote this. This is what the parable is really all about from today's epistle lesson. Familiar verses to us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing not your own tithing and not your own prayers and not your own fasting or anything like that. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, so that no one may boast. And that's all that the Pharisee did, that he boasted, that he was not only among the best, he considered himself the best of the best. So the point of the parable today uh, is expressed with such 
brevity and clarity in these two verses of Paul uh, from, from Ephesians. That stuff really isn't new to us, is it? I mean, it's, it's not, we all know this. Um, I mean, we've been taught this. You know, justified by grace, through faith, for the sake of Christ, not because of works. We've heard this again and again, fortunately and thankfully. So then my question is, what is our takeaway from hearing this same message today? You know, what's our, for those of us who are gathered here, myself included, what's, what's the takeaway? And what I came up with is that what we can walk away from today, from these words today, is that we need to be on guard against the danger that we face. We who have heard this whole business about justification by grace, through faith, for the sake of Christ, not of works, those of us who know and firmly believe that, what is the danger we face? And I think it could be that our prayer would be, God, I thank you that I'm not like that Pharisee. The danger is that we could sink into the same kind of understanding of that Pharisee. And we may say, oh, no, not us. I mean, I mean, this, this Pharisee, it's pretty obvious. I mean, he's right out there with it. Um, ours might be more subtle, maybe more internal. And I think there are a couple of warning signs that we can, you know, examine ourselves about. One of those warning signs could be that when something in our life goes wrong, goes terribly wrong, and we might either say or just think, why me? This has happened to me. Why me? And what's underneath those words? Why me? Because I've been so good. You know, God, I don't deserve this from you. You could have stopped this. Why did you let it happen? Why me? Again, I'm, you know, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm a sinner. But boy, I try real hard. So why me? I think that can be a warning sign for us. I know it is for me. I've got to check out it. Whenever I start thinking or saying about something that happened bad to me, why me? <laughs> the response would be, why not me? Because uh, I'm a sinner just like everyone else is. And it's not what I do. It's not the efforts that I make that earns God's favor. It is only the cross of Christ that earns God's favor for me. So that could be the first warning sign. Another warning sign could be, you know, if we start becoming like this Pharisee, or we might, again, say or think, well, I know I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like those lazy panhandlers and beggars you see on the intersections of all streets around town. At least I'm not like that. At least I'm not like, you know, those welfare cheats. You know, lazy things, they get up and go to work. You know, I had to work for everything that I've got, and they're just sitting back taking welfare checks. At least I'm not like that. I'm not like them. At least I'm not like those unmarried women who keep having babies by multiple men. You know, I got better morals than that. At least I'm not like them. At least I'm not like those wealthy tax evaders, you know, those ones that can you know, afford, you know, really uh, expensive attorneys and find out ways, you know, to make the law work for them and so that they have to hardly have to pay any taxes and I got to pay all the taxes I got. At least I'm not like them. At least I'm honest when I file my tax returns. At least I'm not like those political extremists on either the left or the right, whichever you don't like. At least I'm not crazy like them. I tell you, at least I'm not like those LBGTQ plusers that seem to be destroying our society. At least I'm not like them. 
And if we wanted to spend a lot of time, we could come up with a lot of the other examples. But that's a danger we all could face, I believe, that we don't say, well, at least I'm not like that tax collector. Well, maybe we might. But at least, you know, we become like that Pharisee and looking down on other people, despising other people, you know, and doing, thinking that somehow, we're not perfect, but somehow there is some righteousness in us. And those righteous things should count for something before God. That's the danger. Again, Luke's introduction to recording Jesus' parable is so helpful. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. That was the Pharisee. Could be us. Again, we need to pay attention to the warning signs. And if we do, and if we recognize what those warning signs in us, in our thoughts, and in our hearts, we should be led to repentance, which is what the tax collector did. There is where he becomes our example. Lead to repentance, and then having repented and honestly gone before God, and that God, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not just a sinner. I'm the sinner. And having repented, then we can also be like that tax collector. For Luke tells us after that parable, or Jesus says in that parable, that that man, the tax collector, the one who had repented, went down to his house justified. Again, Christ and his cross. Not anything we do, even though we know better. The devil is always there, you know, trying to slip in, you know, trying to mess with our heads, trying to say, well, come on, you've tried hard, and you've really been pretty good. That should count for something. No, it doesn't. And so that's one of the warning signs. And if we start despising others, doesn't mean we have to agree with them. Again, you know, uh, in the parable, uh, you know, Jesus didn't say he, he condoned everything, every sin that the tax collector did. Didn't say that at all. Not at all. And so, we're not saying that all those other people that we have a tendency to despise, that they're right. Don't say that at all. But he says we're not supposed to despise them. For they too are children of God for whom Christ came and died and will hopefully themselves be turned to repentance. We repent and we go down to our house justified, not because of anything we have done or attempted. Because again, we are, like the tax collector, the sinner. We go to our, down to our home justified because Jesus was the incarnation of God's love and his mercy and his grace. And so we got nothing to boast about for ourselves. Like Paul, we can boast of Christ, but for ourselves, nothing. No boasting, rather repentance and humble thanksgiving, which again, comes home most clearly and most powerfully to us, I suppose, in the Eucharist. Eucharist, the Greek word for thanksgiving. And so may God help us this day and every time we approach the Lord's altar to come with humble thanksgiving. Amen. Now may the peace and the power of God, which passes all of our human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.